Christ is the hope of the believer. I don't believe it holds out any hope to the sinners. It is the sinner's judgment. It is the sinner's damnation. Therefore, if the sinner is to be helped, either individually or corporately, there is only one way that God is designed to help him, and that is by the power of the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And if it's the power, there's no dear power. And if Jesus Christ has all power in earth, there is no other power. He'll never have more power than he has now. If he's got it all, there ain't no more. He's got it now. And he is using that power in the gospel, not only individually, but he intends to use that power corporately, that in the redeemed community, he may manifest the glory of God to the world. I believe the ultimate form of evangelism in this age of grace is going to be the manifestation of God's redeeming power through the total life of a redeemed community that manifests what the gospel can do in every Every area of human life individually and collectively. Verse 31, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was David. I am, I am stressing the fact that the Pentecostal effusion is related to David, brethren. I want you to hold that strongly in your mind now. Verse 34. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now what came back from heaven? That which came back from heaven was the coronation oil that had been poured on the head of David's greater son, the new king. And as the Father crowned him, for we see him crowned with glory and honor, and as he ascended into the presence of the Father and sat upon his throne, he was anointed with a holy anointing oil of his kingship, and that oil came down on the day of Pentecost, and it covered and flooded and filled and possessed and impressed and drove and impelled men and women to become authorities for Jesus. Jesus Christ, as filled with the Holy Spirit, they went out to challenge and to charm and to change the life of Jerusalem and the life of Judea and the life of Samaria and reach to the uttermost parts of the earth until the whole world knew that something had happened on the day of Pentecost. King Jesus had shared the anointing oil of his ultimate authority with the kingly community on the day of Pentecost. And I believe, brethren, that what is happening in this hour worldwide is unprecedented. This visitation of the Holy Spirit is not just to give us goosebumps and teach us to play tambourines and sing new choruses. That's all part of the package. But there's something much more important than all of that. This is God's almighty purpose being revealed that at the end of this age, he's going to manifest his glory in the redeemed community. And this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not only an outpouring of blessing, but it's an outpouring of authority. And he is a Establishing spiritual authority in the earth that he may in this hour bring into existence his kingdom in power and answer the prayers of multiplied thousands through the centuries who have interceded by saying, Thy kingdom come. When he ascended on high, he undertook the government of the universe. The Bible says the government was placed on his shoulders. And so I ask you to turn, please, to Ephesians 4 as we talk 
about the order of God's government. We're still talking about his ascension in verse 8. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. How? By giving some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors or shepherds and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, I submit, brothers, that what is stated here is that when Christ rose and sat at the right hand of God, there was committed to him the absolute government of the earth and of the universe. And it was for him to determine what should be done to bring about the purposes of God. And he chose to do it by the sovereign appointment of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers who would bring into existence a community of men and women, each of whom would know their place of service, who themselves would be uh, recreative and reproductive until there came a body of men and women in the earth who could be compared to a corporate mature man who would, be, who would resemble Christ in their corporiety. And what he was in his incarnate power and life, they would become in their corporate power and life. And he was going to do it by the use of chosen men. He was going to appoint them, he was going to anoint them, and he was going to equip them. How did, or how does God get these governmental authorities? For I'm going to remain with the figure of kingdom. I'm saying that these men are men that God appoints to bring about the reign that is designed in the purpose of God for men. I think that we have a rather a significant illustration of God's sovereignty and his choice. History tells us that Saul of Tarsus was a short, beetle-browed, bow-legged, hook-nosed little Jewish rabbi. We see this little man riding along on his donkey on the way to Damascus. And as he jogs along, the Bible says, that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters. He said, those crazy Christians, they're upsetting all of Judaism. I lay my hands on them and he feels in his pocket to be sure that he's got the letters from the high priest because he's on his way to Damascus to do a job of persecution. He's going to take those people into the synagogue and they're going to feel the lash. And if they die, so much the better get rid of a Christian and advance the cause of Judaism. That's the thing to do, these crazy Christians. And from his sovereign place on his throne, the Lord Jesus looks down and says, I'll take him. I wouldn't have taken him. And I doubt if you would have taken it. But the point I want to make is that I think we need a revival of the concept of Christ's sovereign right to govern his kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a democracy, it's a theocracy. It's not run from the bottom up, it's run from the top down. Jesus Christ makes appointments.